Habits and Health, episode 10. Welcome to the podcast where we give you ideas on habits that you can create that will improve your health in some way. And the the area of health we're looking at today is stress and the stress that can be incurred by worries about finances and anxieties around that whole area. And my guest is Vicky Rouche, and it's the second time on the podcast. She was a, a guest when the podcast was called Exceeding, Exceeding Expectations. And today she's going to talk about some of the financial worries that many people have over the whole pandemic situation and being furloughed and not being able to work and you know many self-employed people really struggling over the last year or so. So that's coming up very soon. If you do like this episode, please do share it with anyone who you think would really benefit from some of the advice that Vicky shares. Please do leave a review for us and why not subscribe to the podcast while you're on whichever site you download your podcast from. Hope you enjoy this week's show. Habits and health. My guest today for the second time, Vicky Rouché. How are you doing, Vicky? Hi, I'm really good. Thank you very much, Tony. And well, it's it's great seeing and seeing you again. I mean, so I'm not sure I've actually explained to listeners. I use a, a platform called Zencaster to, you know, I've been using Zencaster since episode one, over two, two and a half years ago. And Zencaster recently added a video element. So although the podcast is still audio only. I now can actually see my guests and we can actually, you know, when we're, when we're talking. So I can see Vicky this time. Last time we were just just literally talking over the over the Ethernet or whatever. It makes a big difference actually being able to see you because I can see you smiling at me, which is lovely. Whereas before I had to remember what you look like. <laughs> <laughs> and how, so just to remind people who may, maybe haven't even heard, uh, heard the previous episode, what is it you do? How do you help people? So before, there's almost like a a BC and a, an, an AC now, isn't it? Before COVID and after COVID. So, so in the old world, what I did was quite simple. I helped people learn about and invest in property. Um, and of course, that all dramatically changed, not just because the estate agents closed, but because how could you be thinking about investing in property and buy to lets and how you can create your wealthy retirement plan when the whole world was just going crazy, literally sort of this time last year. So as I was saying to Tony just before we started, what I recognized is I was getting so many calls from people who weren't my clients, but were contacts that I had panicking about money. And I realized that actually what I've been doing all the time is help my clients understand what they think and believe about money, their attitude towards risk, et cetera, how much money they need, how much money they've got and how they can make their money work better for them. And that's essentially what I've been doing all the way along. I just never described it that way. Because before mm. I would, excuse me, phrasing it this way, but allow you to invest in property with me, I wanted to make sure that you were financially sound, that you weren't in debt, and that you also had the skills to make sure that the property investments worked and actually generated a profit for you. So I did a lot of teaching before we ever got round to the actual property investment stuff. And now that's the bit that I'm focusing on because I think making that more public is going to be really helpful to people. And and I think also I mean, one of the things about that we're going to dig into in today's episode is how this relates to health is because what, you know, what Vicky's talking about here is so causing so much stress and stress is probably the biggest impact on people's health of, of anything. So we're going to dig into that and, and habits around all of that. And so, I mean, just before we started recording, you, you were talking to me about how incredibly stressed some of your some of the people you were talking to were getting. Absolutely. I mean, they were sensible. Let's say in January last year, they were sensible business owners. You know, they had businesses. Um, they maybe heard that something was coming. Maybe some of them were starting to doubt. Most of them weren't. And they were fine. They thought that they were financially secure. And all of a sudden, when this notion we'd never even heard of a thing, and now we take it as for granted, or what version are we now? Lockdown. You know, we had this lockdown and everything was going to shut and we're going to have to stay in our houses. Not only were they thinking about how could they actually run their businesses, because if they didn't run their businesses, they weren't going to generate income. But that took them immediately to a dark place. Hold on a second. If I don't run my business, I don't get a wage. I've got all of these other people to pay. 
I won't be able to pay myself and my family are going to starve. I need to sack everybody. I need to close the business. Well, that won't help because then you definitely won't have any money. Um, and so many business owners in the way that they ran their businesses always took this very minimum, um, and it's accountants that advise us this, take the minimum um, amount of wages that you can so that you don't have to pay tax, which ethically is wrong, um, but that you take the minimum wage out of your business. Well, then that didn't help when it came to furlough because 80% of nothing wasn't going to feed your family. And so there were a lot of people who thought that they were successful, thought that they were financially secure, but were actually successful and financially unstable because they didn't have sufficient cash reserves, they didn't have alternative streams of income, and that caused massive stress, and it was unnecessary. And so the conversations I had, and the conversations I'm still having over a year later, I'm still working with business owners saying, okay, how much do you need? How do you earn it? What other sources have you got? Let's comb it all out and line it all up, and then they go, oh, okay, I'm all right, or oh, okay, I've got a problem in my business, or I've got a problem in my personal finances, and I can fix them. And it's that awareness that I would love your readers to get from this, whether they go on and they look at the habits, whether they implement the habits, just be aware that money is a tool that you can learn to use, and you can use it well, and if you do, and it's not about becoming a multimillionaire, but just using your money well will stop so much stress in your life. That's it. We could end there. <laughs> why, why do you think it was that people just became so panicked that they were unable to see clearly and see these things that you were able to kind of illustrate for them? But what was it that was making them just well, panic I, I think, so much? You know, it, it's almost like this is this is ordinary to us now, but... If you take your mind back to where we were, say, at, at the end of February, beginning of March, we were starting to hear that there was this um, almost like Hollywood movie about to be launched on the world. I mean, if you'd ever seen the film Contagion, Contagion for real was coming, which is sort of almost ironic that they'd made a movie about it and none of us had prepared. Um, but we were going to have this, you know, plague upon us and, you know, who was going to live, who was going to die. So at that point, you're worried. Am I in the health risk? You know, am I too fat, too old, too everything? Um, apparently, I'm the wrong, I was the wrong blood group at one point. I don't know if that's true or not. But, you know, and there was so much stuff starting, little low levels of chatter. But then there was also the rule coming in from government that they were going to make us all go to our houses and shut our front doors. So then everything became about a panic. Have I got enough food? Do I need to buy another fridge? Panic shopping. Toilet roll. Of all the things, you can't even eat toilet roll, right? You could just get in the shower and have a wash. What you should have been buying is tins of food. <laughs> but everybody went for toilet roll. And, th and that really, that toilet roll story came out of Brexit because somebody said somewhere along the line that imports of toilet rolls would be limited by Brexit. So when the plague came... We all went and bought toilet roll instead of buying actual food. You know, it just, the world just went crazy. And I think we've got so normalized to this that we forget the crazy. And because everybody was crazy, then everything was crazy. Shopping habits were crazy. No longer hugging, hugging people was crazy. Not seeing your family, being inside, only being allowed outdoors for a one-hour walk. You know, everything was crazy and therefore our approach to money became crazy. It's like a magnifying glass on everything. Mm. So in, in the last year, you know, you've been helping so many people and it sounds like, you know, calming so many people down and helping them to be more kind of rational about their issues are nowhere near the extent that they're making them out to be. What, um, what are the main, what are the sort of habits you've been helping people with to, to help them with this and get through all of this? Well, I think if we start from the most distressed person, and not everybody comes in at this point, they all everybody appears with sort of a different problem. But essentially, it's 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 mindset, it's maths, it's financial resilience, and then it's moving forward. So those are sort of the the four things. Now, mindset, 
is understanding what your money story is, what your attitude to money is, and we can come back to that. The math side of it is, do you know how much money you need on a monthly basis to cover your basics? So enough, how much is enough for you to live on? Now that doesn't mean to say you always have to live to that amount, but right now, if you knew how much was enough to pay your, um, your rent, your mortgage, your utilities, some food, and if you can do any transport, transport, just the simple things in life, insurance and mobile phones, simple things in life, then you would know how much money you needed on a monthly basis. You could maybe feel reassured by that number or know that you had to act. So understanding the maths of your life and then getting to a point where you sort out the debt. Now, for conversation this side a year later, I've been having, well, probably let's say the last six months, is a lot of people, because of the financial position they were found themselves in in March, April, got into a lot of debt because they couldn't respond quickly enough. It was like they were having to turn the equivalent of a Titanic away from the iceberg and they couldn't turn quickly enough. They weren't nimble. And so they had to take on debt to deal with the financial commitments they had. So then step three is making sure that we address all of that. Any debts are dealt with and get yourself into a position where you have financial resilience. And that to me means three to six months money in the bank account of your enough, the basics. You can build up from that. But if you had the knowledge that you had six months mortgage, rent, gas, electric, council tax, everything, all sitting in a bank account that you didn't need to touch, that just sat there as a reserve, you could actually just decompress. And that's the financial resilience side of it. And then lastly, for quite a lot of the clients that I'm speaking to now who are further down the line, they're more sorted, is actually looking at the whole picture. So how much money comes in, how much money needs to go out, how much money have you got in personal savings? Now let's look at your business. Where does the money come from? What savings have you got? Is your business hmm, COVID secure? Can you function in your business whether we're locked down or not locked down? Or are you affected by those uh, those waves that we're going to go through and probably going to continue to go through. And if that's the case, how can we create additional sources of income to provide that level of security that you need coming in? And that's really the models in a picture. And, and one of the early things you said in that was numbers. Mm. And it, it seems to me that, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm often amazed how many people really have problems with numbers. Even people who are seemingly really educated have a fundamental misunderstanding of numbers, it seems. I think it's because we get too complicated at school. You know, um, we get into, and I, I don't think that X plus Y equals Z was so much of a problem as when we started to add brackets and it was actually X plus Y in a bracket to the power of two divided by seven equals Z to the nth or something. You know, I mean, really? We needed the concept there. And, and who, except if you're going to be an architect, ever needed to know about Cos's signs and whether your triangle's corners equaled 180 or not? I mean, and who cares whether your triangle eats, equals 180 degrees? You know, we, we went too far. And what we should have spent a bit more time on, and it's, it's a lot of the conversation I'm having now, and, and we mentioned Clubhouse, so... I run a thing on Clubhouse called Money Mondays at 5 p.m. And one of the conversations we're going to have this week is whose responsibility is it to teach children about money, about finance? And for me, it sits in the maths class, right? Mm. It's a straightforward adding up, taking away, multiplying, dividing. Now let's just apply adding up and taking away and even dividing, if you like, to your pocket money. Right. So if you save your pocket money, then you'll have this reserve at the end. And if you want to share your pocket money, this is how you could do it and start to make that link between money and maths. Instead of what we've done is spent years, generations teaching people complex maths that they don't need for the ordinary life so that they can't use functional maths. They can't go into a shop and work out that that offer on the ketchup is actually more expensive than if you just bought the other size bottle. 
you know, and no, you don't need three bags of oranges. You only wanted one. And yes, it might seem like it's cheaper, but you're going to throw one in the bin so it's more expensive. We don't understand that sort of maths. And therefore, when we come to a position like we are now, where we're threatened all around, our health, our mindset for a lot of people, our mental health is being threatened, our physical health is being threatened, our business lives are being threatened, our families are being threatened, then using maths as a tool to make sense of what's going on is the last thing we can think of because we have negative connotations to it that never needed to be there. And, and that's, mm. that's, I think, the, the issue, which is sad. And that's not something that can be easily resolved at all, is it? Far from it. Well, I think... I mean, well, I, I, well, what I mean is for the current generation, yeah. not so much for the future generation. No, I know. I was, I was going to go, well, for future generations, we could teach them. As adults, we could teach our children now, and more of them have been at home. And we've got summer holidays coming up. Let's make sure that all our kids understand basic maths. I mean, some of the maths questions our 11-year-old niece was being sent was being answered by eight adults in a WhatsApp group before we could work out what the answers are. I mean, really? Do we need that? Um, I think what we can do now, and that's where the mindset comes in, is recognise that maths is just a tool, right? Whether you liked it at school or not, and obviously I'm a bit of a maths nerd. I loved maths. I found maths quite easy. Um, I sat in the back of the class doing my homework because I was chapped as the head of the maths teacher. I knew what she was doing. She was working her way through the book. She would teach. She would do it on the... I didn't need to listen to her because I'd read it in the book. I'd answer to the questions. I wait till she gets to the end of the class. We do our mini test. I tick my answers off in the book. And if I've got my answers right, I'm sorted. And then I would just do all my other homework and not, not listen to her because I found it easy. Now, not everybody does. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you've just got to get back to the basics. How much money, how, how much, if you added up all your bills, do your bills come to? And I don't mean including the Disney Channel and Spotify because those, to me, are not essentials. I mean the things that will keep you and your family safe and fed and warm so that's a house with a door on it um that's heating and lighting and council tax because otherwise they'll come we have to pay the council tax the bins the bins get paid by the council tax and then food um and really even your mobile phones and your insurances are a bit secondary but we could include those in here add those numbers up that's it some simple adding now what we're talking about is not a fear of math we're talking about a fear of the answer that maths will give us. Mm. And I spoke with a client, and they run a half a million pound business. I still started with exactly the same question I ask everybody. How much money do you, do you know? How much money you need on a monthly basis just to cover the basic costs? Rent, mortgage, utilities, blah, 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 blah. And they said to me, 7,000 pounds. And I went, okay. Uh, and how many people are in your family? So there's a mother, father, and an older child come back home. So one in their early 20s. Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty of this. How much is your mortgage? And their mortgage was two and a half grand. Okay, fine. So then there's four and a half grand a month. And is this how much you're spending now while we're in lockdown? Yes. Okay. And I'm going through in my head, what on earth can you be spending, the three of you, four and a half grand on, I know I have a bad seed habit, so mine is gardening, and I add up how much I spend on gardening, which is, I'm hoping that it's my future food budget <laughs> in advance, but <laughs> let's be honest, I know it's a bit of a bad habit. How much are they spending on Amazon and takeaways and alcohol to spend four and a half grand a month? And so when mm. we started nitty gritty and getting into it, that wasn't their basics, okay? They had included other numbers. There was insurance in there and their mobiles and things like that. But when you looked at it, they were spending an awful lot of money, not on things that they shouldn't. This isn't a judgment. But when I asked the next question, how much personal savings do you have? And if you mm. knew how little personal savings they had, bearing in mind they had a business that turned over half a million, and they were spending four and a half grand a month on not a lot, really. Not holidays, mm. not replacing their cars, 
they had so little savings. The question I feel you, I have to ask you is, do you really need to spend all of that four and a half grand on the stuff that you're spending on? Couldn't you put some of that money into savings and build up your reserve? And that's hmm. habit three. That's that financial resilience. They had so little savings that they couldn't cover more than one month of their personal expenses. So if anything happened, hmm. let's say they were walking down a hill and they both broke both legs and then they had to stay at home and they couldn't do anything because they were in pain and they couldn't work. Hmm. Now they've got no money coming in because they can't run their business. They can't take their wages. They can't keep their business going. They can't survive for more than a month before they're in really, really dire financial stress. And when I spoke to the woman, she said to me that she was scared to go back and actually look in detail at her finances because she was scared of the answer and she was scared of seeing the detail of what she spent on. That it was, I'm just making this number up, £500 a month on takeaways or something or £500 a month on food or for me, £500 a month on seed packets and compost would be awful, you mm. know? To know that you were spending so much money when you didn't have the savings. And so I think that's it. It's not just the fear of maths, but the fear of the answer that the maths could give you then becomes the second wave of stress around money. And, and that habit that you just sort of touched upon of actually saving money on a regular basis seems to be... In, in the 21st century, is a very different attitude towards saving than it was, say, 50 years ago oh, or, totally. or even longer. Yeah, we've lost it, haven't we? we? We went through this phase where money was so easy. And really, actually, this was before the last recession. This was before 2007, where money was so easy. What we would do is if we wanted something, we would just get a credit card or a loan. It doesn't really matter. And again, this was ignorance about the implications, the math how much that interest was costing you. You know, you buy a, a pair of shoes in a sale at discount, but then not clear your credit card, be charged, you know, 20% in those days on the, on the credit card, let it roll for so long that actually the shoes cost you more than they would have done when they were whole price if you hadn't bought them in the sale in the first place. Our parents and our grandparents would save and buy, save and buy. And somehow mm. the middle generation that we are has gone into, I want it, I'm having it. I want it, I'm having it. And that's incurred debt. Everybody I speak to has got at least two to six credit cards loaded with debt. Now, just to put this in perspective, when I was in my active property buying phase, I had 10 credit cards with debt on, all at 0%. And in those days, 0% actually meant 0% because they didn't charge the admin fees. So I really had got free money and I used that money and I offset it on my mortgage and I used that money to then pay deposits on properties. So it was, you know, I, I went off down like some deep end of working out how to make money work for me. And now there's a way to still do that. And, not, and I'm not giving financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. But when you look at a 0% card, it's not 0% because there's an admin fee. And if we make the maths mm. nice and say the admin fee is 4%, then you're actually paying 4% for that money. So that's as if you took out a mm. loan for 4%. So it's the same thing. The difference is that if you spread that out over two years, then that's the equivalent of 2% per annum interest rate. Whereas mm -hmm. if you took out a bank loan for 4% and that lasted you five years, you're paying 4% every year. But if you mm. take out a call, now, don't go taking out a 0% credit card at 4% over two years, which would be lovely, if you're then not going to work out how you pay that money back. So mm. then what you have to do is take out, and this is where div dividing comes in, you take out however much you borrow, let's make the maths nice and say £2,400, and divide that by 24, because there are 24 months in the year, and as long as you pay off £100 a month, you could have £2,400 to solve something that is incurring debt for you now, clear that debt that costs you money, have 2% money, the value, the cost of the money is 2%, and 
and pay that back £100 a month and in two years from now be completely debt free. So mm. those are some of the conversations. Now, I like half your listeners, I'm sorry, at that point, if you track your numbers, I'm sure your, lead, your listeners will have dropped off. Come back, come back, it's fine. <laughs> the point is, it's just adding up, taking away and a bit of division and you could be debt free. And more importantly, not only could you be debt free by understanding how much is enough and building up your financial resilience, but you could then get to the next stage where you have much more than enough and you're in a position where not only have you got savings in your personal account, you understand where the maths is in your business or you understand actually where the money comes for your employer. Because I think employees need to understand that if they want to keep their jobs, they need to understand how their business, the business that they work in makes money and how they can help that business make money because that's how they get their wages paid. But you could then start thinking about how you can invest in other streams of income, cash flow, not necessarily going into crypto or, or stock trading or anything, but something that generates another stream of income for you. And that could be selling your knowledge. It could be having a business on the side. It could be investing in property. And then you're at the point where you can feel comfortable. You know what you need. You've got what you need in the bank. You've got more than what you need. Now you can turn your attention to maybe helping other people in the community, giving back. Mm. And, and as you were speaking, it, it made me realize, because earlier on I, I said that, you know, the, the, the stress caused by financial worries is a huge factor in many, many conditions that we, we get afflicted with. Um, but it's not even just that. It, it suddenly dawned on me. One of the biggest causes of relationship problems is, is finances. It's the stress caused by finances as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I literally was last night, just as you do, scrolling, and I've got no reference for this source at all, but I think they said something like um, one in nearly one in two marriages fail, and of those, a quarter are due to financial reasons. You know, that's mm. so sad, isn't it? And mm. it's not necessary. And certainly within this framework of understanding your money story, you need to understand where your partner comes from. Mm. I remember speaking to a couple and what he described as rich was what she described as wealthy. And what she described as rich was what he described as wealthy. So when they spoke, they weren't even, they were using the same words, but they had different meanings for them. Understanding whether your partner is someone who thinks money grows on trees or your partner is someone who thinks that money is scarce and are worried about money all the time. You know, Bob mm. and I have completely different risk profiles, attitudes towards money. He's always looking at how much does that cost? Whereas for me, I look at how much does the time cost? So he will search for a bargain and he might spend three hours searching for a bargain and save mm. us 10 quid. And I'm going, but that's three hours of your time. Now, I've, over 20 years, come to realize that actually he enjoys doing that. So let him do it. And if we make 10 pounds saving, then that's great. That's, that's his pleasure. He likes the investigation. He likes to think that he's got a bargain. It's a bit like being able to barter or negotiate you can't normally do that with a website so the only way you can do it with a website is to look at other websites and then find your deal so if you've got right. someone in the family that loves to find a deal let them find a deal that's great that saves you money but recognize mm -hmm. that that is a skill that your family needs they're not just being mean because for me it was like why do we always have to have tesco's beans why can't we have heinz beans and it was because tesco's beans were cheaper well, now I eat Tesco's beans. Quite frankly, they're all right, you know. You can, you can adjust your taste. It's, it's not about lack. It's not about greed. It's not about not having enough. It's about the mindset and communicating. And also, like one family I spoke to, and I'll refer to them as a family so it, it's, it's more anonymized. This person was in the family, the one that has to make the money. Um, their partner was sick, they had a child, and at the end of it, all the pressure was on this person to generate the money for the family. And when we had the conversation, and they finally, and it took three phone calls before they were honest 
in the end, fully honest. They've been telling me bits, but then they really felt like they could dig out the dirt and tell me all of the truths. They were in tears. They were so stressed. They hadn't told their partner the position they were in. And even though I could find solutions for them to solve the problem immediately, they would have to come clean with the partner about the situation they were in. And they didn't feel that they could do that. And so then I had to play a role of supporting them to find a second way, a different way of solving their problems. And they know now that it is completely achievable, that they can, and this is so sad, hide their embarrassment, hide their embarrassment that during lockdown when everybody was struggling, their business was struggling. And in order to keep up the provider role for the family, they had to take on debt that now they're struggling to surface mm. because they can't talk to one another. Mm. And that's sad. And that's, that's, that's very sad. So you've mentioned, you know, you've given suggestions for some habits that people can take on board for, for different things that you were talking about, um, saving and, and so on. Does anything else come to mind in terms of kind of habits that would help people in these situ in you know in these times around finances? Well, like I think I think the the most fundamental that every family just needs to know is how much are your basic bills? Add it up. Know that your family needs one thousand five hundred, two thousand five hundred, or three thousand five hundred, whatever the number is, a month, and then look at how that money comes into your family? Is there one or two people generating that? And do you have enough? Are you at a point where your income equals your expenses or even that your income exceeds your expenses? If you're in that position, great. Then start focusing on your savings. But if you're not, if you're in a position where your income is less than your savings, that is unsustainable. That is never going to get any better. You then have to look in detail at your expenses and what you can save. And quite frankly, even if your income exceeded your expenses and you haven't done this in a while, you should just write down everything that you spend and look, do we really need that? We realized that we were paying, I think, another £10 a month for the Disney Channel, something like that. And it was just so that when my granddaughter came over, if we didn't want to go out, we could watch a Disney movie. Well, we've got a couple of movies that we saved over Christmas. She's quite happy to watch the same things over and over again. She is just four. And there are so many, like, cartoons that we could get for free. Well, not for free. Netflix isn't free, but effectively on Netflix. So we then had a conversation with Sky TV, and we got the whole package down to less than we'd been paying before. Yes, we gave up on the Disney Channel, but actually what we also saved on was Netflix because um, Sky give you Netflix. We were paying for it separately. So all of a sudden, we saved, mm. you know, umpteen pounds a month on a family sharing Netflix that we didn't need. We've saved 15 quid on that. We've saved 10 quid on this. And we're 25 pounds better off. Now, that 25 pounds could be the bit that makes the difference. You know, that over a year is hundreds of pounds. And if you can do that in a couple of areas of your life, that could be the bit that makes the difference. I think something you just touched upon a couple of minutes ago, early on in that, what you just said were that if people were to sort of make a list of their expenses, and, and earlier in the episode, you mentioned about that that lady who was scared to look at yeah. what she was spending because she didn't want to know. And, I, and I, it seems to me that that is an issue with a number of people. They don't. The reason they're not listing down what their expenses are because they're horrified what they're going to see. Oh, totally. But So you're stressed about money. Right? I'm suggesting that you write down and look what you spend on and you don't want to do that because you're scared to see what you spend on. So you're going to go another month being stressed about money because you don't want to see what you spend on. It, it's, it's an insanity loop. Hmm. And, oh, dare I say it, cowardly? Because mm -hmm. at the end of it, if you as an individual are stressed, unless you are a single person with no brothers and sisters and no parents, living alone in a house or by yourself with no friends, your stress will be affecting other people. Mm. So if you're in a relationship and you're not prepared to, and this conversation needs to be with the whole family. I'm not mm. just saying, 
hey, mum, or hey, dad, look at your spending mm. habits. I'm saying, mum, dad, and kids, all of you, how many children do you hear going around the shops going, mum, can I have this? Mum, can I have that? Dad, can I have this? Dad, can I have that? Because they don't understand. They've mm. been brought up, a lot of them, pre the whole drama of lockdown and COVID and financial worries, with they can have anything they want because we were in that mindset in 2019 mm. and before. And mm. if you teach them now, and you don't have to teach them about the, I don't know, the stress you're in. You don't have to maybe share the gory details of the debt you're in if you want to keep that private outside of the family. But you can mm. certainly say to them, we add up how much we spend and we look at how much we spend because when mum and dad or mum or dad or, or any combination of that goes to work, they bring in wages. We have to pay these bills. And it's only when we've paid these bills that we've then got the money to pay for other things. And this is the point where I, I think maybe to share my money story. So I'm, I mentioned on Clubhouse that um, I run this Money Mondays and in the conversation we had last week, um, I shared a story from my background, how when I was on benefits, and uh, maybe that's something useful for your people to know, that, that I've been on benefits. I've added up how much I spend on a monthly basis, uh, on a weekly basis, because I couldn't afford to just waste money. I've also been close to repossession on the house, which is why my daughter's born on the date she's born in July, because of the the stress of money actually gave me preeclampsia which is high blood pressure in pregnancy that can damage the health of the baby so she had to be brought early you know money money and stress it's it affects your life when I picked my daughters up from school the ice cream man sat outside those gates and he was there because he knew the kids were going to come out of school see the ice cream man say to their parents can I have an ice cream brilliant sales and marketing and quite frankly it's a metaphor for every piece of marketing in our lives. They all do it. Anybody who wants to sell anything puts it front and center and makes us believe we want it or makes our kids tell us that we want it and we have to buy it. Otherwise, you're a bad parent. The cheapest ice lolly or ice cream or anything was 50p and it was a lemonade lolly in a, in a silvery packet and I had two daughters and I can't buy one one and they can't share a lolly so that's a pound. Every day, that was going to be a pound. That's five pounds a week. That's 20 pounds a month. And 20 pounds a month was 10% of my entire financial resources for the month, which had to pay the rent, had to pay the food, had to pay the electricity, had to pay our ticket on the train. And I couldn't afford that money. So every day walking to school, I was thinking, what can, what can I come up with for the children today? And I fell on a few little things like, how school, I always positioned myself so that the, um, the van was actually behind them. So I was staring at the van, so they looked at me. So it's very important, the position, the hands I held, whose hand I held and who held whose hand so that we walked in a line and I'm looking at the ice cream shop, I'm looking at a um, van, I'm looking at the children, the children are looking at me, they're not looking at him. And then, oh, the bird, and if they said anything, it was... I've got to have some distraction techniques. What questions have I got stored up? Because I had to stop us spending that pound. And then, little monkey, if that wasn't good enough, he would come round and ring his bell in the evening. So if he hadn't got you coming out of school, at six o'clock he was coming round ringing his bell. The last thing any parent wants to ever give their child is sugar just before bed. I taught my children that the ice cream van was the bedtime bell. And it was the council who came round and rang the bell to help mummies and daddies know that their children needed to be going to bed. And that if we didn't get our children to bed when the ice cream bell came, then we would get in trouble. We don't want that, do we? And I was a single parent, and my kids were in bed by half past six every night of the week because the bedtime bell rang, which meant the curtains were shut, and they didn't see it was the ice cream van again. And that, that was because I needed to manage the money. But my daughters do not have negative beliefs about money. They don't believe money is scarce. They thought we were rich. And the reason they thought we were rich was because I saved up in order that we could have a holiday, that we could go to the zoo, that we could go to Chessington mm. because of the tricks that I was playing in the background. And then as they got older 
I was honest with them. <laughs> Obviously, we, we moved house. And then there was an ice cream van went by with a bell. And, you know, they tend to have fairly similar bells. And they were going, oh, that's funny. That ice cream van plays the same song as the bedtime bell. And then, of course, I had to own up that it was never really a bedtime bell, that it was always an ice cream man. And mummy had told you a, a white lie for our own goods. But, you know, talk to your children about money. And then it won't be so stressful going around the supermarket. Well, and also, yeah, going back to how we started the episode, that's educating them as well. So, uh, the, you know, the, the generation that are in schools now will be much better suited or much better equipped to handle a future pandemic when they're adults than, than we're handling it now. And I mean, th- simple things like, um, you know, do you give your children pocket money? Do they have to earn it? Or do you just give it to them? My daughters Mm. had to earn it. So one daughter liked the money. There's like a two-year gap between them. One daughter liked the money, went out and got herself a job. The other daughter was too young to get a job, but she quite liked ironing. So she would do the ironing for me, and that's how she would earn her money. So, you know, Mm. they learned that if they want something, they could do something and they could earn money for it. And then when they've done something and they earn money for it, they've then got the money. They can then choose how they want to spend it. Mm. So then one of them wanted to go traveling. And um, they were quite comfortable doing the ironing, so they didn't feel that they needed to go and get a job. And I said, no, if you want to go traveling, you're going to have to work out how much money you need. So we worked out on an Excel spreadsheet how much the price of the flight, how many nights you were going to stay away, three months, how you were going to pay for that accommodation. Um, They were going to go to South Africa, so they were going to take a bounce bus. How, How much is the bus ticket? How much do you need for food? And we had all of these budgets of everything. And then worked out how much money they needed. And what I said was, I will match fund you. So you go out and you earn half of it, and I'll support you and I'll give you the other half. They had a job the following Saturday. And not only did they then go to South Africa for three months, but because they then budgeted so well while they were out there and then got a job that provided them with accommodation and saved on their money, they stayed out there for six months. And they've then gone on and used that same technique to fund them to go to university. Mm. So these are the skills that we could be giving our children. And it's funny, as you said that, it reminded me that my mum did exactly the same to me. And it, I, it's only just come back as you were saying that because I, my, when I was at senior school, there was a ski trip and I really wanted to go on a ski trip. And at the time I was doing a milk round, you know, I was helping the milkman deliver milk. And she said, okay, well, what is the price of the trip? I'll pay for half as long as you raise the other half. And so I did it by that milk round and the tips that I was getting and, and so on. And it, yeah, I'd completely forgotten all about that. And it'd be really interesting if before the ski trip, what were you doing with your milk money, your wages? Buying records. Buying right. records. Of course, which is your passion. <laughs> yes, of course. So you would have been buying the records, but now you saw something you wanted. Hmm. Were you... Hmm, I can't think of how to phrase this. Were you denied your music because you wanted to go on your ski trip or did you see that actually there was a priority that was temporarily bigger than your music that you were going to stop buying your records spend the money on the ski trip and then after the ski trip you could go back to spending on your records again I was able to it just made me work harder at the milk round so I could earn additional money and I could be do things that would help me get tips from from the customers. Nice. And so I was able to do both. I could save money for the ski trip, but still buy records as well. I have, you know, and this is this is why you're such an entrepreneurial man. And and you know, the, the, this is see this money story that you're telling me now. Your money story about the ice cream, uh, sorry, your milk van, and not just that you were denied the um, records, but that you did extra to earn more Mm. money because of something that you wanted. That's a money story. Now, that Mm. will also have laid a little line in your psyche that says, if I want something, if I just work a bit harder or a bit smarter or give more value, if we speak in Mm. business talk, if I give a bit more value, then I can have, I can have, well, in my case, it would be my lolly and eat it. In your case, it would be I can have my records and my ski trip. You know, Mm. it's brilliant. Mm. Mm. And everybody will have money stories. You know what would be so great is if out of this, people listening to this, if they could send you 
their money stories. Mm. It would be just amazing to to hear the stories that people could share because mm. you've got a Facebook group. Well, and f- it's funnily enough, the, the, the Facebook group is just about to be revamped and we're I'm going to be making a big effort over the next few weeks. And by the time this episode goes out, it should be in full flow where I'm really going to be encouraging much more conversation and community in the group. So by the time this, this will be going out on the 20th of April, um, yeah, I definitely encourage anyone listening to this to you know, come, on, come into the Facebook group for a start if you're not a member and do share your stories around you know, what Vicky just said. And I think one of the things that we've agreed out of this is that I'm going to write up these notes because obviously I probably scared a few people with the maths talk and everything else, but it's very simple. I'm going to write up these habits. I'm going to, you know, just give you the headline, give you the why, give you what you need to do. Um, if you want, I can even share um, the Excel spreadsheet that people can use and you'll be able to put the PDF and the spreadsheet all in your Facebook group if you want for people. That would be fantastic. And yeah. then they can download yeah. those resources. Mm. I mean, my my passion here is that there is good debt, there is bad debt. And the thing is that when I see adverts on the underground in those old days when I used to get on a train and go somewhere, there were adverts that you could take out a loan and the loan was 4,328% equivalent. You know, payday loans, all of this sort of stuff. Absolutely appalling to prey on people that we're in such dire situations when all it is is a conversation about maths. And, and you know, something else that's funny is I've, up until a couple of weeks ago, I had a very foolish misunderstanding that this whole debt thing is something that's just happened in recent times, like in the last sort of 50 years or whatever. And in the last few days, I've been reading a book about Cicero, you know, in the Roman times. And frequently they keep coming back to the money lenders and how many problems the money lenders were causing then that was 2000 years ago so. oh, it's always been there and and that's the irony is we we think all of this is the same and you know we we bash on about the like landlords for example that they're money grabbing and everything else but but who did you think were the lords of the manor and then there were the serfs that worked the serfs that worked on the farms and everything else they were tenant farmers there was the same pattern it's all there in history Everything is there for us to history. Even COVID is there for us in history with the, you know, the the flu pandemics and everything else that went through it. We're just repeating history, but yeah. the thing is you have to learn from it. You've yeah. got to learn from it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if people want to find out more about you and how you help people, where where are the best places for them to look? Well, I think probably the easiest thing is if you can spell my name, you can find me. So obviously it'll be in the show notes, but it's Vicky, V-I-C-K-I, and my surname is Wushe, W-U-S-C-H-E. So you can go to my website, which is vickywushe.com. There are resources there. There are online audits there, etc. You can Google my books on Amazon. There are books about property investing. But there's also the more recent book, which is called The Wealthy Retirement Plan, which don't be put off that it's about retirement. It's actually about these money habits that you need to be thinking about and how you can, if you start thinking about how you want to spend your time, you'll be better at managing your money because it'll all make sense for you. And then, of Mm. course, come and make friends on Facebook. Um, If you're very businessy, come and make friends on LinkedIn. Uh, There's loads of websites, um, sorry, videos on YouTube, Instagram. And, of course, now the new big thing is Clubhouse. Um, Mm. So you can come and find me on Clubhouse as well. So any social media platform if as long as you spell my name right you'll find me and and finally we we kind of touched upon books you know i mean you've read a number of books but is there a book that um sticks in your mind at the moment that has just fascinated you for whatever reason that you would maybe like to tell people about sure for me it would be the celestine prophecy by james redfield and i read this probably 20 years ago And it's the story of a man on a journey and along the way he is taught or shown how to see the opportunities that are around him um, just by looking at things differently. And I have saved that as my lesson from the book, that there are opportunities all around us. Maybe this podcast is an opportunity for you to look at money differently and to just remove all the stress, create a few good habits, and in 12 months from now, 
you'll have your financial resilience and you'll be creating new income streams and your family will be delighted and happy and maybe we'll even be able to have holidays and you can easily afford them from savings rather than from debt. So the Celestine prophecy is about recognizing when there are, first of all, recognizing that there are opportunities out there and then recognizing when one of those opportunities comes to you so that you can act on it. And, and hopefully this podcast is that opportunity coming to you now. Well, hopefully that is the case. And Vicky, thank you for your time and for your immense wisdom that you just shared with everyone. Because as you say, this this could make a, a monumental difference to some people's lives if they take action on it. So hopefully they will. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Next week on episode 11 of Habits and Health, my guests are Mary Renzo, MD and Ali Hively. And they're They've combined their expertise in the field of dynamic brain function. Mary is a neuroimmunologist board certified in neurology and integra- integrative medicine, while Ali is, um, she holds a master's degree in education and curriculum, and she helps to, she helps the patients implement the stuff that Mary talks about. So they've, they've combined their expertise. They've, they've both experts in very different areas. And it's quite a unique combination, and we're going to dig into that a lot more in next week's episode. If you know anyone who would get some real benefit from some of the advice that Vicky shared with us, please do share this episode with them. Why not subscribe to the podcast so you receive it every Tuesday when it comes out? And please do leave a review for us. It really helps people who are looking around the new podcasts to listen to, if they can get an idea of the flavor and what other people think about the podcast. So please do leave a review. If you're not sure how, sure how to leave a review for a podcast, if you go to tonywinyard.com slash podcast, you'll see a link there with some a tip to a page that shows you step by step with images how you can actually leave a podcast. Hope you have a fantastic week. See you next week.